the keynote speaker of the day. Her name is Melissa Leach. She is the director of the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. As a social anthropologist and geographer, her interdisciplinary policy engaged research in Africa and beyond links environment, agriculture, health, technology, and gender. Her particular interests lie in knowledge, power, and the politics of science and policy processes. As we discussed earlier, she explains how and why politics matter in food system transformation. And don't forget, as I said, you can ask questions if you have them, ask them through the Q&A app, and we will be able to ask Melissa Leach to answer those questions after her keynote. First, I would like to welcome her to the stage via digital means. Melissa, hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well today, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here with everybody and to hear all about these extremely exciting projects. Yes, and same here. We're very delighted to have you. We're an, we are in anticipation. We have viewers from all over the world who are waiting to hear from you. And uh, I would just want to say, uh, not take the floor, but go ahead, Melissa, and uh, we'll, okay. we'll speak later on. Well, wonderful. So if I could have my first slide up. I've got some slides to, to click through. Um, and while that's while the tech team are just getting that involved, um, let me thank the organizers and actually congratulate um, NWO Watro and all the participants of what really is an incredible set of projects, as we've already been hearing in the introduction, locally contextualized, embedded and grounded. Um, but what I want to do in this keynote um, is to take the opportunity to look up a bit and to address the question of perhaps the bigger transformations in food systems that these projects and others could help to add up to. So that's one way of thinking about the question of scaling and to address why I think that has to be seen as a political process. So I want to try and lay out why it is I think that politics matter, but also how politics matter. What do we really mean by the power configurations that have already been highlighted in some of the introduction? So if I could have my next slide. Um, the starting point for my talk really is that current food systems are neither sustainable nor equitable. So um, just to throw out a few facts, we're seeing at the moment global food insecurity at new levels um, after actually a period where it was in decline. But um, as of last year, there were 822 million people suffering from hunger. That of course has increased through the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic and its social and economic impacts. But it's not just about overall hunger. We also see nutrition insecurity as a, global, as a growing problem globally. One in three people suffering from malnutrition of various kinds as the Global Nutrition Report has underlined. And then we see what Raj Patel called very evocatively the stuffed and starved phenomenon, where some people are overnourished and suffering from obesity, while others are undernourished within the same countries, within the same communities, sometimes even within the same households. Next slide, please. So on the environmental sustainability side, um, I think it's also very clear that the dominant trends in food production and especially the industrial food production processes we're used to are damaging a planet that's already under pressure, ecological and earth system processes. Um, food production contributes up to half of greenhouse gas emissions. It's contributing in many ways to um, destroying biodiversity, to unbalancing nutrient cycles, to land degradation and the overconsumption of water. Conventional industrialized food production is also keeping many people in poverty, workers, farmers, um, and not contributing to their empowerment or ability to claim their human rights. And then we've got um, what's increasingly referred to as planetary ill health, um, where the links between environment and health, human health, um, animal health are becoming increasingly clear. Um, one example is just the way that the emergence of zoonotic diseases, COVID-19 of course being one of them, um, reflect the industrial, agricultural, wildlife exploitation and marketing patterns that dominate in the world. So next slide, please. 
At this point, these challenges are becoming pretty urgent. Um, we have 10 years to go to the deadline of the Sustainable Development Goals, where food is often seen as a sustainable development goal of its own. Number two, dealing with hunger. Next slide, please. But actually, food and food systems are relevant to all goals, as this figure from the, from the, the FAO shows. There are synergies between them, so improve food production and improve um, the use of water and land. There's a natural synergy there, but there are also tensions. Get your food production systems wrong and you end up undermining your water table or actually undermining gender equity. So we need to be aware of those tensions at the same time as seeing food as central to the SDGs as a kind of package which has, and I think these are probably more important than the goals themselves, these crucial cross-cutting principles of leaving no one behind, that's an equity principle. And these five Ps, which were set out when the SDGs were first launched, of people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. So next slide, please. Thinking in terms of food systems is really helpful because it does um, begin to um, emphasize how drivers, processes, the many actors and institutions within them and outcomes are all deeply interlinked, highlighting some of the feedback loops within them. And I know that a food systems perspective has been very important to this food and business research program. There are many ways of depicting food systems. This is just one. Um, from the high level panel, but there are others. But I think what it also highlights um, is that there are multiple actors and interactions. And given the focus of this program on businesses, it's worth highlighting that businesses are relevant at many, many points as part of production, as part of consumption, as part of the value chains which link producers and consumers and many others along the way, including business actors as part of those drivers that we see along the top. So if I could have the next slide. Thinking about the, the kind of ideal, the aspiration that one has in mind, um, here's a picture of how we might think about food systems changing, moving, transforming towards something that colleagues and I from Future Earth have called equitable sustainability, a space within which the goals of equity, the goals of environmental sustainability are both met. Um, a, a space defined in part by the SDGs, but not stopping there, moving ahead to look to, to a future. Maybe we'll see something like some future SDGs um, indicated by this, this circle. But in any case, the future that I think the world needs, that we all need wherever we are, is one where our food systems are both equitable and sustainable. So next slide, please. How do we begin to get there? How might little projects locally embedded begin to add up to these bigger changes? So um, this, I would suggest, is fundamentally a political challenge in several ways. First of all, because power and politics actually infuse the whole food system. The diagram, the high level panel diagram that I, I showed a few minutes ago, has power and politics sitting in a few boxes along the bottom. But um, I would argue, as do my colleagues in the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, that actually power infuses every driver, element, relationship and dynamic. We need to think of food systems as power laden. They are themselves power systems. We then need to think about pathways. And um, that diagram that I showed with those wiggly lines moving up into that equitable sustainability space, um, one can imagine, and I've, I've sort of depicted those, those kind of moving systems in my work with colleagues in the STEP Center and other partners, as pathways, pathways as directions of intervention and change, which are always underpinned by politics and power. And if we're going to meet some of these really big challenges around food systems, the changes, the ways in which these pathways move, the ways in which systems begin to evolve and change can't just be incremental. They need over time to be transformative. Sometimes little pathways can add up to bigger transformations. 
Um, so there's nothing wrong with starting small, but they do need to begin to add up or scale up, to use the, the metaphor of this, this conference. And that, I would suggest, is where politics really come in. Um, as colleagues and I have argued in a, a, a book we wrote about the politics of green transformations, um, transformation is political and it is about politics. So next slide, please. But how do we think about politics? How do we begin to unpack these power configurations? Now, work on power, of course, goes back decades, if not centuries. It's been probably the most researched um, and thought about and conceptualized concept that we might imagine. Um, but we need to be able to, to, to unpack and actually to streamline our concepts a bit if they're to be usable. And what I want now to do in the, the rest of this, this talk is to outline a number of different approaches to food politics and power. Um, moving from some that are probably very familiar to those of you who've worked on these, these 75 projects, um, through to some that perhaps might be slightly less familiar, but come out of other areas of social science and of activism. And I think need to um, help expand our repertoire of understanding power and politics. And this matters, this is not just a theoretical exercise because the approach we take shapes our practices, our practices of research, of co knowledge creation, and also critically at this point for a program like this of mobilizing evidence to attempt to create impacts and to help to make those impacts add up to the big transformations that the world now needs. So next slide, please. So I begin here with um, an approach that um, colleagues and I have called food interests and incentives and as a sort of summary view. And this would see change as happening um, by actors seen as rational, responding, making decisions in response to shifting incentives. Now those actors might be businesses, um, extending from farmers through to bigger businesses, um, they might be actors in market chains of various kinds. They might be policy actors. Um, and they might be making decisions about, for instance, market incentives to put in place fertilizer subsidies or not. Um, or where are there going to be price incentives for food that's sustainably produced? One could think of a whole array of them. Now, the conceptual basis for this kind of really quite familiar way of thinking about um, impact and policy change um, it comes particularly from political science and from what are often called pluralist models, as well as from um, economics, particularly it's sort of more neoclassical and now sometimes behavioural sort of nudge economics. And it takes quite an instrumental view um, of how policy changes um, and tends to see power as quite overt, visible power, power over. I think in, um, and there's nothing wrong with this kind of approach. I think in taking it forward, we very much have to recognize that, that the private sector who are part of this group of actors is very diverse. Um, we might want to be looking at one end of the spectrum to farmers and entrepreneurs, um, up through family enterprises, through small and medium sized firms, up to those that are perhaps um, operating nationally, even linked to the state or operating multinationally. They're all important. And there are going to be power relations and differences of interest and therefore responses to incentives between them, as well as between business and non-business actors. And I think because of this, um, we need to be wary of um, easy phrases like inclusive business, because they can so often, it's easy to use them, but they can so often hide this very uneven balance of power between stakeholders um, within and between businesses, as well as between businesses and others. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, I think a focus on incentives um, also, and, and, a, and a sort of unpacking of um, businesses also needs to alert us to some bigger power dynamics. And one of those that has most struck me globally in relation to food systems in the last few years is actually the degree of concentration of power that characterizes our current agri-food systems. And if we look at, at almost all of the, the, the products and um, the, that are important to production, and one could repeat this for consumption, 
there's an extraordinary degree to which it's a very few firms who dominate production, supply, marketing. Um, this graph just shows some involved with seed and pesticides. Um, and actually this degree of concentration is getting worse. Um, and this actually is a bigger power dynamic that would tend to rather work against the kind of localized bottom up example that we see so well represented by the projects in this program. And we need to be aware of it. Next slide, please. So this brings us to um, my kind of second power perspective, um, which again is quite familiar. And this is to think about um, food innovation systems. Now, many of the projects in this, this program are about technologies. They're about innovations defined most broadly as doing things differently. And it's really only quite recently that power and politics have been linked up with innovation approaches. Very often, um, they've been technologies have been seen and innovations have been seen as driving change in and of themselves. We just need to get the technology right, um, whether it's a seed, a, 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 new, um, a new marketing technology, a pesticide, a, a, a new form of consumption. Get the technology right and things will change. But of course, it's not as simple as that. One reason why it's not so simple is my points here at the bottom, the recognition that technologies and technical interventions must always fit their social contexts and arrangements. Um, if they don't, they're A, unlikely to be effective, and B, very often have a fallout which can lead to all kinds of forms of inequity and indeed unsustainability. So that's one key point. But the other is that if we again take a slightly bigger picture look, we see so many ways in which technologies and innovation systems become locked in to particular ways of thinking and doing and acting, which make it rather difficult to appreciate that diversity. The pictures here just highlight the Green Revolution, um, which with its, its founding fathers, and they often have been fathers, um, not mothers, um, in diverse parts of the world, have nevertheless put forward a particular kind of innovation package involving um, some adaptations around a particular theme of improved seeds um, and inputs, packages, which are meant to be driving food production and improvement. Um, but as the IPES food report that I show here from uniformity to diversity has argued, food systems to respond to the challenges of transformation and to respect local contexts actually need to be much more diverse than that. And that diversity is challenged by the power dynamics of concentration, as I showed in the last slide, but also by the lock-ins through which innovations become channeled into path dependencies, the assumptions that there are standard ways of doing things um, and the assumptions that that is correct. And it can be very difficult for more diverse, localized, bottom-up perspectives to get a look in. Um, and one of the theoretical perspectives that has tried to conceptualize this, the multi-level perspective, envisages um, bottom-up localized innovations becoming niches that in turn can gradually begin to, to kind of make inroads on um, that dominant landscape, a green revolution type landscape, if you like, and begin to scale up and out to affect that process. But that in turn involves power. So if I could have my next slide. Um, one set of reflections on this, on, on this process of lock-in um, and the relationship between the technical and the social and questions of equity, um, it just comes from a project that I've been involved in, which I, I, I offer as part of, if you like, the, the 75, because it, I find it quite good to think with and to illustrate some of the bigger points I'm, I'm trying to make. Um, and this was a project that tackled um, a demand-led challenge, the challenge of building climate smart agriculture, and the idea that there are technologies that can really help with this. Um, and this in particular was the technologies of biochar. Um, stoves which char um, wood and often waste products, bury them in the ground and serve the win-win of fixing carbon because they are and forming highly carbon-rich soils, 
um, producing great, more greatly improved um, soil fertility and therefore beginning to tackle poverty. A fantastic win-win, if you like, which could be um, directed in a bottom-up way towards meeting national and indeed global challenges. But um, the project that I was involved in, if I could have the next slide, um, asked a different question um, and looked to the fact that evidence from some parts of the world suggested that farmers were already doing something not dissimilar to biochar, but through indigenous practices. And this was research that looked at the Amazon and told a, a story about terra preta, the very rich black soils that underlie about 10% of the Amazonian rainforest and were formed by um, local populations before European conquest. So going back um, more than 500 years. And these terra preta soils also have extremely high fertility um, potential to sequester carbon because they contain a great deal of charred carbon or biochar. This was an indigenous practice that supported large settled farming populations. But from my earlier work in West Africa, if I could have the next slide, um, colleagues and I, our team hypothesized that actually there were already um, practices indigenous practices in the West African forest zone, which were forming carbon rich soils through indigenous ways of, of living with local ecologies. And we set out um, to do an interdisciplinary um, engaged um, research project of much the kind that many of the, the, the projects under the food and business research program have been doing. This one was very locally embedded. It started with farmers' own knowledge and their views of their effects through participatory research. And what did we find? If I could have the next slide. Um, we did indeed find that there was an indigenous practice which we called African dark earth formation, um, which had some names. So the Mende people in Sierra Leone we worked with talked about Porle, these deep black soils. They talked about the way they were formed through everyday deposition of palm oil, agricultural food processing wastes, um, which formed in rings behind the kitchens where women particularly would depose these wastes and um, created highly fertile soils that people found to be super fertile compared with the quite lateritic red background soils. And these were highly valued, particularly by men who used them as tree nurseries for tree cash crops, but also perhaps most importantly by women um, who found these highly fertile places for their gardening as a source of independent income, which was in turn deeply important to intra-household equity. So if I could have the next slide. Um, our soil scientists then found that these soils did indeed have very high levels of carbon, um, very similar to those Amazonian terra preta. And we suggested and published and communicated this as an indigenous African soil enrichment technique, which could be a climate smart alternative for sustainable agriculture with very positive implications for gender equity in particular. But what happened? We did go ahead to try and create impact through a development project in Sierra Leone, the FOSED project that was trying to build sustainable upland farming, through an EU project that was trying to do biochar and develop stoves. And we said, actually, you could do this rather differently by starting with local soil improvement rather than with the technology of the soil and in Ethiopia, where one of our soil scientist colleagues put forward the idea of indigenous fertilizers that could help to supplant the chemical fertilizers that were being um, put forward by government um, researchers and policy frameworks. But we encountered um, a quite problematic interplay between um, these alternatives that we were offering in these different sites and a mainstream which was convinced that chemical fertilizers were the way to go, and that actually um, upland farming anyway was pretty unproductive. And the focus for agricultural development, um, certainly in this part of West Africa, should focus on inland valley swamps where you could apply these green revolution, improved soil and water management packages. 
Um, and our, as for our EU Bevy project, well, they really like their stoves. And they were quite interested in what we were finding, but fundamentally, they had a technology project um, and it was driven by um, improved stoves and that's what they stuck with. So um, this story of perhaps challenges in creating impact um, led me and leads me now to suggest that we need to think more broadly about also some other approaches to power and politics. Um, if we're to make our local projects count and if we're to help them add up to bigger transformations. So what are some of these wider approaches? Next slide, please. These are moving down my table. And the first is that institutions matter. Um, and I think we can valuably look to long-standing literatures and understandings that see changes happening through bigger shifts to the norms and rules of the game, which is one definite of, of institution. Whether these institutions are really local, they're the norms governing perhaps intra-household and gender relations, or whether they're what happen in a community or nationally around land tenure, access and rights over land, over water, over inputs and outputs, whether they're the institutions driving collective action, um, as Eleanor Ostrom's fantastic work showed so clearly, or whether they're the global institutions involved in regulation, um, which might perhaps help, help to quell some of those dynamics of concentration that we see in the food system and help to make space for some of those alternatives. So institutions matter, and I think we need to look to these and bring in a more institutional political economy analysis, which looks at power up and down our value chains. So if I could have the next slide, please. The second approach goes even bigger and actually even more historical to take on board the literature um, on food regimes. So um, here, food um, change is seen to happen through um, more fundamental shifts in those historical alliances between state and capital, quite fundamental shifts in structure, um, questioning the basis of capitalism, um, perhaps requiring revolutions of certain kinds. The conceptual basis here is in um, theories like world systems or historical materialism and their applications in food work by people like Phil McMichael, who argues that actually food regimes have gone through several. So there was an imperial food regime which, which drove quite a lot of colonial exploitation. Some of those elements are still with us today, but they've been, um, been also overlapped with um, a regulatory regime linked to um, the development institutions post Second World War and particularly structural adjustment and the rolling back of the state. And then now, um, we're dealing with what could be argued to be a corporate food regime driven by the power of corporations and transnational corporations in production and also in consumption. Challenging some of these bigger regimes um, is really hard and it does involve bigger shifts in the relations of production and consumption that we're dealing with. But I think if we ignore these, we also ignore some pretty crucial power dynamics. So if I could have my next slide, one of the ways um, that challenges to bigger um, institutions and indeed regimes happens is actually from the bottom up and it's through movements and the politics, the contentious politics through, through which um, social movements in the arena of food as in many others begin to um, challenge power relations through sometimes um, unruly forms of politics, sometimes through face-to-face -face movements, sometimes through advocacy. And um, here, food, food transformations has a lot to learn from theoretical perspectives around social movement theory, and also from the examples, and there are many which have emerged around the world, whether we're talking about um, things like the food sovereignty movement, the agroecology movement, starting sometimes from peasant movements quite locally, but moving transnationally so that local movements in some places connect up with, e with each other into global transnational forms of advocacy 
or indeed um, the movements on the consumption side that have challenged food prices um, and the, the forms of inequality that have sometimes kept people very poor. So movements are happening and they are happening not just locally, but, open, but, but across the world. And I think offer one way to begin to challenge some of these bigger regimes. So then if I could have my next slide. Um, as we begin to think about movements, we're involved in a world where politics are not just the material politics um, of, of resources and their access and their control, but are also the politics of knowledge. And um, what we call um, food politics work on discourses really highlights this and sees changes happening through the interplay of diverse knowledges. Um, these can be local, and I think in our projects here, we've got some great examples of local concepts and perspectives, um, which, which offer different ways of thinking about food and change. And my Dark Earths example was one that very much highlights the importance of looking at local knowledge. But also these encounter bigger discourses involved in, in production and consumption. Um, and, and the example that I highlight here is perhaps as big as they get and just shows that something like um, Coca-Cola to take um, a hyper, hyper modern, hyper global symbol perhaps of a kind of consumption that we might want to challenge is itself subject to multiple discourses. So at the top, we have Coca-Cola adverts, which see Coca-Cola as representing, in a sense, as part of a discourse about global diversity. In the middle, we have Coca-Cola as the subject of discourses of resistance in Chiapas, saying, actually, we want water, not Coca-Cola. And then at the bottom, we have the appropriation of this most global symbol by local business and youth interests in Trinidad, where um, the name of, of, of this campaign, which sees Coca-Cola as a sweet black drink from Trinidad, really localizes the production and the consumption process and links it up um, with local, local businesses and with local food consumption cultures where Coke is part of young people's um, picnicking and liming and the ways they socialize and drink together. So um, work on discourse, I think, can really be enriched by perspectives sometimes coming from decolonial work, from feminist work, as well as from the anthropology and the sociology of knowledge. And then if I could have my next slide, the final perspective takes this even further and begins to open up to perspectives um, which see changes happening um, both directly and indirectly through people's interactions with non-human natures and um, responsiveness to the very diverse ways of being with nature that we find around the world. Now, I think some of these probably exist within the projects we've seen. Certainly the example that I use, that Dark Earths project, has quite a non-Western, non-binary um, view of, of soils behind it. People see soils and, and their productivity as part of the intimate relationships between um, settlement and everyday life and gender and ideas about fertility, very much being embedded with the fertility of soil. And um, what an increasing body of work um, in many disciplines, um, but taking seriously more multi-species perspectives and linking up sometimes with, with indigenous thought begins to show is the ways that these alternative um, kinds of knowledge offer us ways forward for future ways of living with nature, which might be more equitable and sustainable. So um, if I could have my next slide, what does all of this add up to? Now, I've, I've shared a range of different approaches to food politics and power, which to some degree overlap, but they are nevertheless embedded in quite different theories and conceptual bases. And that's why I wouldn't suggest that we can easily just integrate them 
um, because we then end up with a kind of lowest common denominator splodge, which actually takes away some of their edge, which we do need. So I tend to talk rather about triangulating amongst them. And if we begin to triangulate and look at the richer picture we get from um, taking this broader range of, of approaches, what do we see? We see some key cross-cutting lessons. One is that food is crucial, not just to development or to agriculture or to production, but it's also part of broader relationships between states, businesses, citizens. Um, and the power configurations that are part of those. Um, secondly, I think we see that a focus on business interests and incentives, and perhaps a critical stance to the workings of corporate power as part of those are important, but that really mustn't blind us to other aspects of power, and indeed of marginalizations and contestations. And some of these other approaches highlight those. Um, the diverse interests and the pe perspectives involved and the kinds of thought that one begins to get from feminist, indigenous, non-human nature perspectives and more. And I think we also see the importance of combining material dimensions of politics and power, control, concerned with control over resources, opportunities, profits perhaps, with the politics of knowledge, whether, whether seen as the interplay of different knowledges, whether seen as the cultural politics of production or consumption, or whether seen in terms of dominant discourses and challenges to those. So if I could have my next slide. I think we also begin to see a series of cross-cutting questions, which I would suggest we should be asking of all pathways. So thinking back to those pathways um, and the ways systems move within a space of equitable sustainability or not, um, we need to ask questions about four attributes of those pathways. One is um, D for direction. What directions are they moving in? What goals are they representing in? Are they staying within that equitable sustainability space or not? How could we reorientate them? That in turn um, raises questions about distribution. And this is really where equity comes into play. Who stands to gain or lose from either the pathways that we've got or the transformed pathways we'd like to see? Um, how does choosing between those pathways affect inequities, whether they're inequities of wealth, of resources, or of opportunity across these different kinds of axes, class, gender, place, and so on. Then there's a third D, which is about diversity, um, because it's very clear that one size doesn't fit all. Context matters, as I think these projects are very well aware. And so, too, we need a diversity of pathways. They need to be diverse enough both to resist these powerful processes of lock-in to a singular solution um, and also to respond to that diversity and variety of contexts and values. And then the fourth D is all about democracy, not just democracy in that formal sense of formal democratic institutions and parties, um, but democracy also in a more informal sense, opportunities for inclusive voice um, and processes that enable, enable um, deliberation, both about where pathways are going and how they might get there. So um, if I could have my next slide, um, I just want to um, conclude with a couple of points then about the implications for um, research, which of course is what this program is all about. So um, at IDS, we've been talking, as I think much of the research in this fantastic Watero program has been, about interdisciplinarity, about transdisciplinarity, about co-creation, about collaboration. And at IDS, we've been bringing those things together in an approach we call engaged excellence, which sees interdisciplinarity, co-creation, um, the mobilization of evidence for impact and doing that through excuse, enduring excuse, partnerships excuse me, as pillars of an engaged sorry, approach. Melissa, sorry to interrupt, but we're, we're ru running over time. Okay, uh, can I just have my, finals, my yeah. final slide, which is my last, yeah. my last point? S sorry. Uh, I've been instructed to, to mention the time limit that we have. I'm sorry about okay. that. Okay, 
So if you'd like me to stop, otherwise I can no, just, just you can offer a, you can a finish. concluding point to the talk, but yeah. I'm happy just to stop. No, 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 add, you add the concluding point. That's okay. That's okay. You can f add the concluding point. Okay. So um, it was really just a call to action and say, if we're going to, all of us, um, work in this engaged way, in a deliberative way, in a way that respects power um, and realizes that political engagements are sometimes going to be antagonistic and contentious as well as easy. Um, we need also to be aware of our own assumptions, our own position in these power relations, and to be prepared to confront and challenge those. So this is the challenge I would put before all of us in our different roles as we seek to um, engage our research with the transformation of food systems now and into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa Leach. Thank you. And again, sorry for interrupting, but it's just because of the t <laughs> the, the yes, schedule okay. aspect I'm of the sorry. conference. Sorry to no, no, sorry to no problem. It was fascinating. I could go on for hours about the village back home in Uganda and the African dark earth and the maybe even the importance of oral tradition and, and, and rituals and learning from, from indigenous uh, people and communities and, and the gender balance. So fascinating. So much to unpack, especially about the power and politics. But I'd like to go to uh, one or two questions because people have been going at it in, uh, in the chat. <laughs> so yeah. be, be, be prepared. How, can, uh, how then can science bring changes as normally uh, we are considered neutral and we tend to avoid taking a position? Okay, so um, I think science needs to declare its positions. Um, science can be objective, but um, objectivity in, in my view, um, lies in making clear the, the implications of one's science, whose interests it represents, and the partial perspectives it represents. Um, a technology, a, 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 a way forward for science, evidence, um, yes, can be, can be fully, fully robust in terms of the, um, in terms of the, the, the methodologies it uses, the findings it puts forward. But the way that science um, is used, the implications it has, and indeed the questions that are asked in the first place, always has direction. It always has positionality. And I think we need to be much more aware of, without, without undermining the, the, the rigor of our, our methods, of, of the selectivity of the questions we've asked, the evidence we've chosen, and particularly the way that we then mobilize that evidence yeah. um, for particular outcomes. Okay. And to open up also to the other kinds of science, the other kinds of questions that could have been asked, but perhaps weren't in our particular project. Interesting, you also spoke about uh, expanding our repertoire, even learning from activists, uh, fantastic. Another question here. Um, how could research help local and global movements who fight for fairer food and trade systems in a context of decreasing civil space? Okay. Well, I, I think there are, there are very much two questions there. So um, there's a phrase that's sometimes used around evidence-informed advocacy. And I think, it's, um, I think it's important that scientists don't become advocates themselves and that we... we we, we keep that boundary between, between science and politics, but nevertheless, advocacy movements, whether they're in civil, civil society or um, alliances between civil society and business or, or movements, um, need to inform their positions with evidence. And science can do a very, a very good job in, in providing that, that evidence and being clear about about what it says and what it doesn't yeah, say, yeah. and then movements are able to to draw on that and take it and take it forward. Yeah. Somebody somebody here is critical and says, "Why does Dr. Leach not touch on the political economic interests of local governments, uh, go government research elites, blocking plur pl pluriform seed markets by promoting state-led monopolies?" Yeah. Well, um, if I'd had more time, I I <laughs> would I could have elaborated on those points. Um, I think particularly around um, those approaches to innovation systems and indeed the, the interests and incentives because um, this is part of the, the lock-in processes that I, was, that I was talking about. 
um, lock into standardized, often quite high input approaches to, 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 to agriculture and to production um, is driven by sometimes the alliances between business and, and government, whether it's nationally or whether it's, whether it's locally. Um, and, and actually beginning to, to pull apart and interrogate those, those, those lock-in processes and those alliances is yeah. part of beginning to, beginning to challenge them and perhaps finding, finding chinks in those alliances and beginning to, to put forward alternatives in different, in different ways. So no, I mean, I very much agree with um, the, the, point that's, the point that's been raised. These are very critical. Yeah. This is not just about global players, local government actors and local business interests often very much are hand in hand and have allied perspectives on, on a certain way of doing things. Maybe in the, in the future we can ask you to come back. I, I heard you say a few things um, about um, the concentration of power in agri-food systems. You know, the, the gray area or tech, uh, technical innovation uh, interventions must fit the social context and arrangements. But you also spoke about the power and politics infused the whole food system. And I was wondering, because the Stone Age didn't end because the stones were finished, uh, wh wh how do you look at this politically? For example, the Biden administration might be stuffed with old Ob Obama appointees. Can we change this with the old political guard? Because you're actually nearly calling for a revolution. Well, I think... In a polite um, way. I think there are... There are opportunity. There, there are. I think political regimes um, can make things more or less easy. And so the last question also um, raised the last question also raised the point about the closing space for civil society. And I think this is a problem in many countries around the world, including actually the U.S. in recent times. And I think where one begins to get a change towards a, a different kind of administration, as we've seen in the U.S. Um, there's maybe a prospect for 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 thinking differently, for doing things differently, and actually there have been some very positive um, moves already coming out of the Biden administration, which 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 is um, talking rather differently about food food regimes, and I think there's also a higher level global geopolitics um, about this, um, which which is also offering some glimmers of hope. So next year sees the UN Food Systems Summit. It's the, the biggest one that's ever been held. It's under the auspices of the United Nations. Um, and I think this will be a huge opportunity um, really to put some of these transformative alternatives on the table and show why they matter. Um, and the, the, the task is really now on to make sure that those streams of thinking are open to the kind of perspective coming from from science, including the research that's going on in this on in this program, Thank you so much. and to the perspectives of civil society, um, I think that also, um, to be honest, COVID nineteen has created some openings, um, partly because the the economic and social fallout and implications and impacts have been so bad, including for food that um, there's, there's actually a, an appetite that we might not have seen even a year ago for thinking about for some more fundamental rethinking. Thank you so much again. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Melissa Leach, 